talking. It's kind yes. Of like... Yes, you have to. It's like a it's like a walkie-talkie. Yeah. I've got my slides uh, and uh, how uh, just uh, technical advice. How can I uh, show my uh, screen? Yes. Okay. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen in Zoom, you'll see a green button in the middle yes, of the yes. screen. Okay. So okay. if you click on there. Yes, I did. And you get a whole load of different options for how you want to. Um, but actually, to be honest, the first option is the best. Okay. I, 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 I can. Uh, uh, I chose my PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So I'm going to use everybody. There. So, Dina, after I mute everybody, you'll have to unmute yourself, okay? That's it, we've got your slides. Okay. And now I can't see where I can mute you. <laughs> uh, no, participants, mute all. There we go. So, Dino, just unmute yourself now. Uh, uh, I, I don't see my... Okay. 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 Can you hear me now? We can. Mm. <coughs> I, I don't know what... Um... We can hear you and uh, we can see your screen, so you're ready to go. Okay. So, you can see... Uh, I, I'll put them now. Okay, is that okay? That's great. Yes, that's the title. Can you can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, I have to say uh, uh, at the beginning that I, if I am talking today, that's uh, Nicholas' fault. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, because uh, I, when I replied to the Ampa chat. Uh, invitation, I said, uh, uh, I would like to uh, propose uh, some point for discussion, but I haven't uh, a formal paper or a full uh, well-organized paper. So, please, uh, ap uh, I apologize for this random presentation. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, I gave this title, uh, language, and please interject any moment if you feel like it and if something is not clear. And uh, as a subtitle, you can uh, read AMPA, where now goes you, thou? Uh, uh, that's uh, something that John Ansom uh, uh, wrote uh, in reply uh, to, uh, as I, I, I'll show in the next uh, slide. And uh, uh, this uh, collection of uh, slides is a tentative answer from my point of view uh, to this uh, um, question. Where uh, now goes thou, Ampa? Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 it's here to move to, to the next. So, Ampa prehistory. On 17th May, uh, to, uh, 2019, John Amson replied to the following questions by Stephen Fry, asking for a one-line reply to the following questions. One, what was the theory, thesis, leading to this, meaning the uh, combinatorial hierarchy? Second, uh, what was the actual aim of this endeavor? These are John Amson's replies. For question one, the then existing body of theory about self-organization and the need to understand more. So this was the theory leading to, so it's a prehistory uh, of the combinatorial hierarchy. Second, to produce either a physical uh, electronic model or a discrete model of a system displaying self-organization capabilities at various levels. That was the aim of this endeavor. To document them, uh, uh, the, the, these replies, John attached a transcript of discussions 
held in 1960 at Burnham Overy Tower windmill in North Norfolk, North Cambridge, adding that regarding one and two, the sheer historical importance of those Ur discussions can never be underestimated. So I take I took that very seriously. Uh, because, uh, for they still raise so many as yet unanswered questions. So this is uh, the uh, the document uh, uh, self organization and the notion of level, a summary of three discussions uh, held in the Tower Mill and so on. And uh, oh, I can't move f further. Okay. And uh, uh, so this is a transcript uh, edited by John Amson, who says the uh, writes uh, the importance of this 1960 working paper is that it reports the first significant discussion of the innov innov innovative notion of a hierarchy of informa information preserving structures with at least three levels. The fact that there were levels, I shall insist on this. The precursor of what eventually, after much for further detailed research, became the busting Parker Rhodes, Hampson, Kilmister combinatorial hierarchy. So, uh, and now uh, I am taking quotations from uh, the uh, this uh, transcript of these discussions. Uh, in the Overy State Mill discussions, quote, an attempt was made to state the essential characteristics of a self-organizing system. This attempt aimed at specifying the machine and must be set against the contrasting definitions produced at the end of the week, which look to our changing uh, state of knowledge of the structure of the machine to justify the use uh, of the term self-organizing. So this is what uh, it's a, a kind of summary uh, which I uh, made or uh, 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 a collection of quotations which I thought uh, 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 relevant to what I shall read afterwards. Uh, the discussion started from Rigby's. Uh, by the way, in that document that you, you find in the AMPA chat uh, uh, archive, uh, uh, you find a list uh, of the participants. So I won't uh, say about uh, uh, what is uh, who is mentioned here. Anyway, the discussion started from Rigby's intuitive idea of what self-organizing systems are, and generalizing from the attributes he had always found uh, such ma machines to possess, uh, a, a self-organizing machine has at least one goal at any time. Two, it can change its structure as well as its state in producing its output. So being a machine, obviously the, the approach is uh, purely uh, uh, operational. And Bastin added an o another uh, um, uh, uh, attribute or uh, requirement. A self-organizing -organi system must have a scan. Most generally, this means that the system must be divided into at least two parts, such that the state of one part as a whole at a given instant can be used to modify the behavior of the other part. I take this, uh, 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 if you put, uh, if you recast this in linguistic term, uh, a hint to a distinction between uh, language and meta-language, in this case system and uh, some uh, and the part scanning or representing uh, the system. 
Uh, and then uh, uh, it's uh, a system with levels. Uh, Bastin said that a system with levels might be used to represent the discriminatory levels which arose in various sciences. He particularly mentioned the levels of degrees of discriminations, discrimination defined in physics by the available probing energy. Uh, 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 in, uh, uh, between brackets, uh, it's uh, the reference to the page of the transcript. Bastin's physical example uh, uh, provided a physical example, a hierarchical scheme of levels in physics. Then uh, Pask uh, said, it may be worthwhile considering other appearances of levels in self-organizing systems. The one I am familiar with arises in a Turing machine which can make statements about its own state. In terms of these self-referential statements, we can construct a hierarchy rather like Russell's types. Here uh, is another point uh, I shall uh, 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 dwell upon uh, afterwards. And there are two ways of getting levels. One out of the meta-language idea, this is mentioned ex explicitly, and two in a Turing machine. My comment to this, the two ways as, as I see them is one through the separation of language and meta-language and two through a theory of types. The two ideas in my opinion, coexist in a language containing its own meta-language. Uh, further, Bailey, only when a machine consists of at least one self-organized system being studied or scanned by a second self-organizing system, only then is the whole system going to be valuable in application to experimental data of any kind? So this distinction of uh, parts or levels, uh, the, uh, uh, as you uh, want to, to uh, describe them, is uh, very um, important for uh, the application of, of the system to experimental data. My comment. Uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, this distinction of levels was thought to be necessary. And then uh, there was another, uh, uh, for me, relevant additional interpretive uh, principle. Prin uh, there were uh, several, but I, I mentioned just one. The stochastic approach to it, uh, investigated mechanically, was to have priority over the logical algebraic approach. So there is one uh, uh, stochastic approach which I would call in terms of, uh, of the distinction made uh, by Peter Rollins in his talk uh, uh, the approach of reality one. And uh, the second, the algebraic, is uh, the approach uh, in, in my opinion of what uh, uh, Peter uh, called uh, reality two. And then uh, 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 the, uh, Basting had uh, hitherto concentrated uh, in his uh, th uh, thinking on the latter, the algebraic one, uh, even though the machine stochastic approach had been described in very general terms in one of his publications. So Basting agreed that the stochastic meta method was the obvious next experimental step. So there is a, a, a theoretical uh, algebraic uh, part and also a, a, th a experimental uh, application step of the uh, system. Oh, now I come to uh, my own uh, part. And my primary basic, very basic idea is to consider language as a self-organizing machine. 
that's the point uh, I want to in, uh, insist upon. Uh, uh, I, I'm not thinking of uh, uh, a, a kind of electrotechnical machine, uh, all the uh, apparatus of, of, uh, of a computer, but also language as a material uh, component of which is the science, uh, the sounds of the utterance and so on. So it, it, uh, it, it works as a machine and uh, as a self-organizing system and can be taken as a machine for the purposes that they were thinking about. And uh, in order to de develop my argument, I shall make to, uh, reference to uh, two uh, characters. By the way, all the participants to this discussion were, uh, well, not all, but the, the, the discussion was organized uh, uh, by the Cambridge Language Research Unit. This was founded by Margaret Masterman, and uh, there were other scholars, but uh, not uh, many of the uh, founders of this group and some of the founders of the uh, members of the Cambridge Language Research Unit were uh, between the founders of AMPA, such as uh, Frederick Parker Rhodes, Stan Bustin, and, and uh, I can't remember which. Uh, 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 now, what I am insisting about is this uh, uh, Michael Halliday, uh, the father, we may say, of systemic functional linguistics, was one of the uh, found, uh, founders of, of the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Language Research Unit. Uh, uh, at that time, Halliday uh, was in Cambridge because he had been in China to study Chinese and actually in Cambridge he was lecturing on uh, uh, Chinese and uh, he wanted to uh, get his PhD but he was not accepted uh, at uh, the uh, uh, School of Oriental Studies uh, uh, at uh, London University because he was uh, suspected of, com of uh, communist uh, sympathies. And then he went to Cambridge and in Cambridge he was accepted. By the way, he, 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 uh, most of you, I think, know that Parker Rhodes was a member of the British Communist Party. So, uh, but uh, in uh, Parker Rhodes' uh, book, Inferential Semantics, there is an app, uh, appendix on intonation, which comes obviously from Chinese, and that, that's uh, a, 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 a clear uh, influence by or, uh, Halliday. It's mentioned uh, explicitly, but uh, there are uh, other influences, as I shall try to show. Uh, let's start from Parker Rhodes' idea of rheumatic, what he called rheumatic, a term that he declares he, he took from uh, Coleridge, who wrote a, a treatise on uh, logic as well. Uh, so what's rheumatic and, and what's uh, its purpose? Well, uh, the Cambridge Language Research Unit uh, was uh, uh, working at that, at, uh, at that time on automatic translation funded by the American Navy uh, because they had uh, many bases scattered all over the world uh, and uh, having uh, uh, automatic translation was quite useful uh, for the purposes, practical purposes. Anyway, uh, uh, rheumatic. Uh, let's see how uh, Parker Rhodes defines it. The idea was that uh, in translation uh, there was an invariant and uh, uh, this, uh, 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 well, uh, first uh, le le let me uh, read uh, this uh, quotation. Uh, rheumatic uh, deals with the structure relationships and notation of uh, uh, the, the, the quotes are to Parker Rhodes' inferential semantics, the references, the page references. Uh, so uh, rheumatic deals with the structure, relationships and notation 
of expressible thoughts as they exist before and after the speak exchange in their pre-linguistic, pre-utterance condition. So, rhematic is uh, a theory, uh, a, a way of representing uh, uh, also mathematically uh, the state, uh, the structure uh, of expressible thoughts. And uh, thoughts, uh, and Parker Rhodes notes, I didn't put the quotation, but thought it's a very generic way to uh, uh, point uh, to this uh, notion of uh, a pre-linguistic uh, content. And this is very important uh, for what I shall say uh, later. For instance, just uh, as a digression, in Cambridge now there is uh, somebody, uh, Peter de Bola, uh, um, trying to uh, um, uh, work on what he calls conceptual history. So the, the, the shifting uh, of concept through t uh, concepts through times uh, uh, with the computational uh, means. Uh, and the notion of uh, a, a, a concept uh, uh, by, uh, uh, in Peter de Bolle's work, uh, work, is very, very, very similar to what Parker Roth says here about uh, rheumatic, about a ream, something which is pre-linguistic. Uh, and it's a kind of generator of uh, the meaning in uh, semantics, as we shall see la uh, later. And then another characteristic uh, is that uh, uh, is that of the indispensability of the context to the understanding of an utterance. So context, uh, uh, without context you cannot uh, produce meaning. It appears that, uh, then that the context of an utterance ideally includes everything both verbal and situational which may have a bearing in the interpretation of the utterances emanating from it. Then uh, one uh, mathematical uh, uh, um, means uh, Parker Rhodes used to represent, uh, to, to, do, uh, to build a rheumatic uh, uh, and to represent the lexicon of a given language uh, it, it was uh, a, a thesaurus, thesaurus, and uh, Parker, but Parker Road applies uh, the thesaurus pr uh, uh, principle to lexigens. So to these th uh, things, uh, pre-linguistic, uh, pre-utterance, uh, rather than to actual words. Because the idea was that uh, the rheumatic structure was the invariant between different languages and then you would apply the uh, gen generative transformational uh, rules of each uh, uh, specific language to get uh, the, uh, uh, the translation from one language to the other. And the mathematical structure of the thesaurus is uh, ideally a lattice. So uh, the, the, this problem, rheumatic, was dealt with mathematical uh, means. Now to Halliday, and I, 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 I'll read some uh, quotation by Halliday, so you can see the similarity uh, of uh, what Mike uh, Halliday theorizes to uh, Parker Rhodes' uh, attempt. This. Uh, 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 the first uh, quote. It is a general feature of uh, semiotic systems that they develop and function in a context and that meaning is uh, a product of the relationship between the system and its environment, where that environment be be may be another semiotic system. For, inter, for instance, uh, an object language. For language, the context of the system is the higher level semiotics 
I insist on this, higher level semiotics, which it serves to realize. So, language is a realization of a higher level semiotics. Hence, it is the stratal representation. So, language is made of strata, of levels, that allows us to interpret the context of the system. What Malinowski, Malinowski, as you know, is the, was the anthropologist who uh, influenced very much uh, uh, first the linguist, which was the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the basic reference of uh, Halliday when uh, for the systemic idea of linguistics. So, uh, the, uh, this uh, straighter representation allows us to interpret the context of the system, what Malinowski sa uh, uh, calls the, con the context of culture, uh, and, uh, and it is in this sense that, uh, uh, well, pay attention to this, semantics is an interface interlevel in earlier terminology, namely when we are considering it as the relationship between lexical grammar and some higher level semiotics. So here we have already uh, uh, two levels, uh, the higher level semiotics and uh, the lexical grammar. And uh, semantics is the interface so the relationship between these two levels is an interlevel or a, 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 an interface, as you make, as uh, Halliday calls it. So this is just one part, of the upper part, the higher part of uh, the the, uh, the system which constitutes the language. The uh, lower part uh, is uh, is the, the the following. Uh, which is a continuation of the former quote. The context of a text, on the other hand, is uh, what Malinowski uh, calls the context of situation. So, uh, this context refers uh, not to uh, language itself, but uh, to the external reality. So, this is uh, for uh, uh, language as uh, a, a self-organizing system, what affords the experimental part, so the reference to the external object, uh, of the, to the external object. The configuration of semiotic processes that are constitutive of its rhetorical structure and shape its ideational, interpersonal and textual characteristic uh, characteristics. Systemic theory has always been explicitly contextual in both of these senses, the former one and, and, and the, uh, the second one, uh, this one, the context of culture and the context of situation, uh, offering contextual explanation for such problems as how children learn language from what goes on around them and how language provides a grid for the construction of models of experience. Uh, again, Halliday. Uh, well, uh, if I'm going too long, please uh, tell me, because uh, I, I do not have a, a, a watch here, and I, I don't know how much time. Uh, I, Take a time, Dino. Uh, OK, thanks. Uh, again, Hall Halliday again. The power of language comes from its paradigmatic complexity. This is its meaning potential. This meaning potential notion is very, very, very important. It, uh, uh, it, uh, for me, it, it uh, uh, sort of uh, evokes uh, the idea of quantum potential, uh, uh, something like that, at least. Uh, the higher level uh, semiotics, as we have seen. So it's a very, uh, in other terms, something very similar to the nothing uh, uh, um, um, Lou was uh, talking about uh, yesterday. 
So to explore the question, how big is a language, we model it paradigmatically, not as an inventory of structures, but as a network of systems. This follows Firth's, Firth's theoretical distinction between system and structure. So you see an explicit reference to Firth, uh, the linguist uh, who influenced Halliday so much. A system network is a means of theorizing the meaning potential of a semiotic system and displaying where any part of it is located within the total semiotic space. It is designed to offer an overview, a comprehensive picture covering a language as a whole. Uh, 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 and just quoting the title of uh, 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 a chapter that uh, uh, Halliday wrote uh, recently, 2013, in, in this book, a Systemic Functional Linguistic, Exploring Choice. So uh, uh, what does that mean? It, it means that uh, uh, when uh, we, as, uh, we uh, generate a semantic from the higher level semiotics, uh, we make a choice. And uh, so uh, th this choice I I is not given. It's something which is generated in a way stochastically, I think. So uh, the uh, stratal uh, representation, it's a representation, uh, I put uh, also semantics, but uh, uh, more correctly semantics, uh, as I said before, is an interface between or an inter-level uh, uh, between uh, the higher level semiotics, that is the meaning potential, and uh, the lexical grammar, which you can represent uh, when Parker Rhodes uses a lattice to represent uh, uh, the contextual, uh, uh, a context uh, of, an, uh, of an utterance, he builds a lexical grammar from a level. And then uh, there are the meta functions, the ideational, interpersonal, and textual, which uh, govern uh, the reference to the uh, situational context, so to the extra linguistic context. So the, the, uh, I put this slide to, to uh, emphasize the fact that there is a level, uh, a hierarchy. Semantics, let's come to semantics. What was my problem uh, 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 about? Uh, uh, the, the problem of the relation between identity and uh, uncertainty. Rematic uh, ensures semantic identity in translation. So we can define identity. And semantics presupposes a higher level of uncertainty, a higher level semiotics, which is uh, potential. It's not uh, definable, it's not definable. Uh, so it's the potential which has to be realized in a lexical, uh, in a lexical grammar. Uh, by, the, by this term, it means uh, uh, an organization of lexical items uh, which has uh, a, a certain structure similar to the syntactical grammar. But uh, uh, this is not at all. Uh, is it, uh, there is not at all a, a, an isomorphism between the syntactical and the semantic uh, 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 grammars. Uh, for instance, uh, let me mention this uh, uh, incidentally. In uh, the good old-fashioned uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, John Hochland mind machines, he uh, uh, expresses this formalist motto, take care of the syntax, the semantics will take care of itself. 
So the, uh, the, the formalism of uh, which was made use of by artificial intelligence, the so-called formalist and symbolic uh, artificial intelligence, the good old-fashioned one, uh, uh, was presupposing a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, 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 syntax and semantics. Many of analytical philosophy is based on this proposition. It's absolute nonsense to me. Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, so the, the relation between identity and uncertainty, it was uh, a problem. So uh, how do, uh, uh, um, well, uh, so we have to investigate uh, 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 how self-reference works in language, in a system like language. So, in my opinion, self-reference in language depends on the distinction between language and meta-language. This doesn't mean that uh, 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 there cannot be identity between language and meta-language, because if you take a language containing its own meta-language, it's uh, the same language, the same system, but there are these two parts which you can distinguish, or at least these two levels you, which you can distinguish uh, through uh, a theory of types or something like that, as it was mentioned before. So, in my opinion, as I said in, in an intervention yesterday or the day before, task is separation between language and meta language to avoid paradoxes <laughs> is a catastrophe because it uh, 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 produces such expressive limitations in uh, standard logic that uh, do not allow you to represent a self-organizing system. Just uh, one uh, uh, example. In uh, uh, first order logic, uh, 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 in uh, the uh, conventional uh, Russell's uh, white uh, uh, formalism, uh, uh, you cannot say that something do not, uh, does not exist. You have to express it through the uh, existential or particular uh, quantifier. So you, you cannot say uh, uh, represent a sentence like uh, Pegasus does not exist. And uh, uh, well, uh, 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 for instance, free logics were uh, introduced uh, just to solve this problem, distinguishing between a referential uh, interpretation of the variable and a substitutional interpretation of the variable. If you take the value of a variable not as an external object but as a, 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 another expression of the language, so in a metalinguistic uh, sense, then you can say something th this doesn't exist. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, ta Tarski, uh, uh, I had not time to, to, to uh, present uh, the quotation of Tarski uh, just now, but he says it explicitly that this distinction was made to avoid paradoxes. Uh, and, and now uh, let's uh, 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 go on to Barway's and then and uh, and the uh, analysis of the liar paradox. Here is what they say. An adequate analysis of the famous liar paradox has, has shown that the liar's sentence, this proposition is not true, is a sentence that can be used in many different ways to say many different things. The liar's sentence gives rise to no genuine paradox, and what once appeared as paradox now looks like pervasive ambiguity. So we have to distinguish of the same sentence two different, uh, two different uh, uh, acceptations. One is uh, uh, um, uh, 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 
uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, see the, the, this uh, more explicit uh, quotation. Let's distinguish between the meaning of a sentence and the propositional content of a statement made with it. Intuitively, the former should be a propositional function. So here the meaning is identified with a function. Something that gives us a proposition when supplied with the situation the proposition is about, while the latter would be such proposition. So, that, uh, thus, a sentence can be ambiguous in terms of propositional content without having two separate meanings, without expressing two distinct propositional functions. The propositional function is the same, but in one sense it's taken as a first-order assertive statement, and in, in another sense is, is uh, 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 construed as a, a second-order uh, rule uh, for inference. Pace, uh, the logicians, I don't know how you pronounce this Latin in English, pace, we say, uh, the logicians who abhor ambiguity but love paradox. Now, uh, uh, about ambivalence, let's see what the mathematicians say. Hestness uh, wrote, Clifford may have been the first person to find significance in the fact that two different interpretations of number can be distinguished, the quantitative and the operational. On the first interpretation, number is a measure of how much uh, or how many of something. On the second, number describes mm -hmm. a relation between different quantities. Well, uh, uh, I may, uh, uh, if I'm not uh, uh, di uh, di making too many diversions, uh, in the 80s, I think, uh, uh, Barwes and Nechemendi produced uh, a program uh, to teach uh, uh, logic uh, with a Mac, and they called it Mac World. They realized that students were not uh, making exercises, uh, making demonstration uh, through uh, an algebraic uh, uh, procedure. But they were used. Uh, they were using uh, diagrams, and so they started study uh, studying at uh, the Stanford uh, uh, Institute, uh, uh, CISL. Uh, I I don't remember uh, what exactly the acronyms means. But uh, this problem of demonstrating t through diagrams, geometrically, I would say, and. Uh, uh, since I'm an historian of philosophy, I uh, uh, may recall that Proclus, a Neoplatonic philosopher in uh, uh, late uh, antiquity, uh, um, wrote a, a commentary to Euclid's Elements. And there he was distinguishing different kinds of demonstrations. Uh, the arithmetical one, uh, the algebraic one, and uh, the geometrical one. And so this is, is nothing new. So, and, uh, and it's not uh, by chance, I think, uh, that uh, this was said by a Neoplatonic philosopher. Uh, Cantor was reading Proclus to deal with infinite, uh, infinite sets uh, and uh, its uh, transfinite uh, uh, sets uh, theory. Anyway, uh, uh, there are two interpretations of number. So it means that the same uh, symbol or expression can be used in two different ways. One uh, uh, quantitative, so referential, descriptive, and another operative as a rule. Uh, 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 as a diagrammatical uh, uh, device uh, to represent spin, for instance, also as we have heard, uh, I'm not very... Uh, anyway, Spencer Brown says more or less the same thing. 
Spencer Brown's calculus admits of a partial identity of operand and operator. Its primary al algebra provides immediate access to the nature of the relationship between operations and operands. For an operand in the algebra is merely a conjecture presence or absence of an operator. So this conjecture presence, in my opinion, refers to this higher order, uh, higher level semiotics. Uh, 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 um, Halliday was talking about. So with this, uh, with this uh, proposal, uh, with, uh, with this calculus, Spencer Brown uh, thought of having uh, uh, dispensed, uh, 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 disposed of uh, the theory of types, but. Uh, the distinction between language and meta-language, between quantitative and operational, still is there, I think. And uh, uh, anyway, so this is the last part, and I had no time to produce uh, real slides. Uh, let me briefly comment on this point, if I have time. Please, uh, if there is no time, please uh, stop me. No, do you know you're fine? Okay. Uh, 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 Ryle, in his concept of mind, says that uh, a mm, general law, uh, natural law, is not a proposition about the world. It's uh, a, a, he calls it an inference ticket, something that allows you to uh, infer from one uh, uh, factual statement to another factual statement. And he says that uh, 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 general uh, uh, propositions expressing uh, laws, uh, natural laws, are uh, like uh, algebraic propositions. Uh, higher order statements. Uh, one uh, uh, philosopher who was very much influenced by Ryle, uh, he admits it uh, in his in the uh, second edition of his uh, uses of argument, um, takes on uh, this idea, and uh, uh, this is an important. I am in the story of philosophy, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it led to what has been called the discovery of uh, uh, the topics. A medievalist uh, scholar uh, who was at uh, Notre Dame uh, University or Notre Dame uh, is, uh, English, uh, it's, uh, it's called in England, but anyway, the rediscovery of the topics is the fact that uh, this uh, theory uh, 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 re- uh, proposed what the medievals was, were already discussing, the logic of the topics. And uh, uh, Ryle had, uh, uh, probably uh, was very conscious of this because he sent Tulmin's uh, 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 uses of argument to Otto Bird, who was this scholar in uh, uh, Notre Dame, to review the, uh, the book of Tulmin. And there, uh, uh, um, it shows that uh, uh, w the uh, content of Tulmin's uh, uh, theory was a, a reproposal of uh, a medieval theory of the topics. And uh, this is not, uh, I thought about this, and this is not uh, surprising. Uh, why? Because uh, medievals uh, were very, very, very uh, skillful in logic, but uh, they didn't have a symbolic language. They used natural language, so they had to be very careful to distinguish in natural, the natural language they used to, uh, between the metalinguistic use and the uh, object language use 
of a sentence, of an expression, or whatever you uh, uh, you want uh, to to anyway. Uh, mm, so uh, the fact the fact that a natural language contains its own meta language was not a disadvantage. It was an advance an adva a, 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 an advantage. So uh, they they, uh, they were in the topics. Uh, uh, the, the, the topics dealt uh, with uh, what uh, are called enthymemes, that is syllogism uh, imperfect in the sense that they uh, lack of a premise, the major premise. And the, why? Because the major premise can be uh, considered not as a stated premise, but as the rule which uh, 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 allows you to move as an inference ticket, as I would say, from the minor premise to the conclusion. That was the essence of the topics. Uh, and these, uh, uh, but I, I, I can't uh, dwell on this. So they made a distinction between formal and material consequences. Formal consequences uh, were uh, uh, had a, a, a formal rule, uh, a, a tautology, uh, something which is a, a formal uh, th theorem. And the material consequence uh, is a consequence uh, we, uh, 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 derived from a material proposition, like all men are mortal, Socrates, uh, if you take that as a rule, uh, you say Socrates is a man and uh, uh, Socrates is mortal. John Stuart Mill, in his theory of uh, uh, real inference, made the same uh, argument. He, wa he was using, uh, <laughs> as, as an example, the Duke of Wellington is uh, a man, so the Duke of Wellington is mortal. Why? Because, and he, he mentioned the fact that uh, there are propositions from which you derive consequence and propositions according to uh, which you uh, derive consequences. And if a real uh, uh, inference from the minor to the conclusion is sound, it can be put in a perfect or accomplished deductive form taking the rule and stating it as a, an asserted premise, premises. This is observed by Na, uh, Nagel, who uh, writes uh, a, also a review of Tolmin's uh, book, and Nagel mentions Peirce. Very important. Peirce uh, was studying medieval logic and took the the idea of uh, formal and material consequence from uh, Duns Scotus. Anyway, this is all history. Uh, so the, all, all of this uh, 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 matters for me to the so-called deduction theorem, uh, 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 because you, uh, 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 on one uh, uh, side of the equivalence you have the stated premise. On the other side, you have the rule. So the, uh, the deduction theorem is a meta theorem which uses uh, the, the true uh, acceptation of the same sentence. So, uh, um, last uh, uh, thing uh, I have to say. Uh, what uh, was uh, all of this about? Because um, the idea uh, which uh, led me to uh, get in touch with Ampa was uh, that I, I wanted to uh, uh, do something uh, in uh, co uh, computational text uh, analysis. And now, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I'm, if you are interested, I can. Uh, um, if you take uh, some uh, stochastic uh, observational data, like uh, text uh, mining data obtained with the so called vector semantic, uh, you represent. Uh, uh, 
um, uh, words uh, with a vector, and then uh, you get uh, a multi-vector, uh, multi-dimensional representation of the relationships between. Uh, so the problem uh, then uh, you can uh, get uh, the the co-occurrence uh, of uh, 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 you can identify with uh, the technique uh, which is called uh, word embedding, uh, the, uh, the co-occurring words uh, to a certain term. And that's uh, the context, uh, uh, ideational context, as Halliday would call it, to define uh, uh, the way in which a certain word is used in a corpus, in uh, the texts of an author. But when you have an interpreter, the, his context, his cultural uh, context, the, the book she has read, uh, he or she has read, uh, is uh, uh, are other books. So the co-occurring terms uh, with the, uh, are different. So you can make a comparison and uh, uh, sort of uh, try to fi uh, to. Um, define, construct a computational model for the analysis of interpretive processes. Uh, uh, so that's uh, what I try to, to uh, sort of suggest uh, in a paper. I give this. Uh, it has been translated uh, into English. Uh, you have a link here. Uh, the translation is not very good, uh, but uh, it was made by a friend of mine. I couldn't uh, insist very much on, on correcting it. And so I think that uh, I am at the end of the story. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dino. Um, uh, that, that was, uh, there's so much in there. Um, uh, I'm sure there are going to be loads of questions. Um, I've got I've got quite a few, and um, it, was, it was really wonderful presentation. So thank you. Can you stop uh, sharing your screen, and then hopefully we can all look at each How other. Can Everybody can turn their cameras on. Uh, it's probably best to keep yourselves muted, but if you want to talk, um, um, just hold down the space bar while you're talking. Okay, uh, but but uh, 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 I, I I I cannot. Uh, Okay, so um, in the... I, in, not, I do not see uh, any more the screen. <laughs> the zoom, <laughs> the zoom uh, uh, window. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't open the zoom window. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm going to stop. Can I, I gonna... can I disconnect and reconnect? No, no, no. I think I'll, I'll stop your video. I think that will work. Um, if you can manage. You might have to restart your video in a second. Okay. No, nope, that's not it. Uh, I just want you to stop sharing. Otherwise you share and that'll take over. Yeah. Um, so does someone want to ask a question uh, while we're just trying to sort this out? So uh, was that Doug? Yeah, I was suggesting that you um, you share, and that will take over his share, and then you can. Re oh, okay, all right. Let's do that. Yes, you're quite right. <sighs> okay, now it's now now you're watching my screen, and I'm going to stop it. Stop okay. sharing. There we are. Lovely. Oh, we can see each other. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Lou. Oh, I better hold. No, you you're okay. There. Um. It's very interesting that the, this initial discussion prior to the combinatorial hierarchies, papers, and so on, began with the idea of thinking about a machine that would capture the linguistic situation. And um, so uh, I'm wondering if you can say a little more about how it was that they began by talking about formalizing in the form of machine. Uh, 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 well, uh, uh, I uh, I think uh, I have to probably uh, read uh, the paper itself, uh, but uh, they, they, they wanted to um, uh, so uh, the discussion. I can I can say this. Uh, 
uh, the discussion was not only about physics. It was Bastin, as I said, that proposed a physical model, physics as a model for this uh, uh, self-organizing machine. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember, but it's uh, uh, right at the beginning uh, that they say the motivation. And then I didn't mention uh, the the final, uh, one final mm, uh, um, remark. Uh, well, uh, dis uh, everything disappeared from my... Can you hear me? Yes, and we see Yes, you. we can hear you and see you now. But uh, the window, of the, the Zoom window disappeared. I don't know. Oh, okay, it's back again. Uh, so, in uh, one, uh, uh, maybe I have it here. Just one moment. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 somebody called Coles, uh, 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 this is a quotation from the transcript, uh, felt uh, that uh, uh, other schemata had been substituted by the participants for Bastin's, which was the physical example, so uh, ref uh, a system describing physics which was the one Coase was interested in uh, in developing. And that uh, this uh, substitution had made a discussion, according to Coase, go up in the air. So, and uh, uh, from the list of participants, I saw, it, it, it's an abbreviation, it says that department of Eng. Eng, I take it for engineering and not for English, because he must have been an engineer uh, who <laughs> was thought that discussing about <laughs> these other uh, models uh, uh, of a self-organizing machine uh, uh, were uh, taking the discussion up uh, in the uh, uh, up in the air. Uh, so. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, discussing about a uh, self-organizing uh, machine uh, was uh, uh, one of the purposes of the uh, Cambridge Language Research Unit because they had to propose a computational uh, form of automatic uh, solution to the problem of automatic translation. I yes, think... And Pask uh, himself was also involved in all those ideas about self-organization and, and in learning using machines. So, so his context slightly different from the Cambridge group, but very closely related to it. Yes. So, but I, 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 I don't know, because I only recently uh, started uh, trying to see how much uh, Halliday uh, had influenced uh, the ideas of, of Parker Rhodes on uh, rheumatic, uh, which were applied to the theory of automatic translation. And I think there is a, a very, very uh, close connection between uh, how uh, language, uh, the uh, language as a system or as a, a collection of subsystems uh, can be uh, thought in systemic functional uh, linguistics and uh, Parker Rhodes' ide idea of uh, representing this pre-linguistic content uh, as a rheumatic uh, representation. So that, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then now uh, there is a, a, a book uh, on Margaret Masterman, for instance, the idea of the thesaurus came from Halliday as well, I think, because he was studying Chinese. And uh, an ideogram is a polysemic sign, and they used a, a term. At the beginning, I didn't understand why they chose some uh, a term like that, a fan. 
so the the range of polysemic meanings of of an ideogram was called the fan because the fan is very common in in China and so I think that uh, uh, this is another in uh, indirect uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 I don't know uh, <laughs> element to think about uh, Halliday's influence on the idea of the Cambridge Language Research Unit. But, it, but it's very interesting to think about that initial discussion in relation to where the combinatorial hierarchy went with Baskin and Noyes and Kilminster and so yes. on. So uh, that was because the they, they chose some specific syntax in order to go forward. And then they wanted to get higher and higher levels of, of, um, of discrimination and commentary coming out of their initial choice of syntax. And so, um, and so it still is imbued with the original discussion. And, um, and Noy's later idea about program universe was, uh, again, thinking of the model as being something like a machine. But the choice, the, the choice of, uh, of syntax is very small in relation to what you might ambitiously suppose if you were going to model all of language. Oh yes, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I um, that's why yesterday when I um, uh, addressed the question to you, I was thinking of this uh, system made of levels or of strata uh, and uh, the, uh, be, uh, and uh, I agree that because the uh, Spencer Brown solution is uh, kind of uh, uh, collapsing the levels. Uh, no. Uh, in, no. In, in my, no, no, it's not. It is a dictum that says you can start by understanding that the distinctions are not necessarily yet made. That does not make it collapsed. It means that you are in the creative position of allowing distinctions to come forth and that distinctions that come forth can be released. Okay. Yes. That yes. does not collapse everything. But, that but, 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 allows uh, but, for the creation of hierarchies when they are useful and for the uh, release of hierarchies when they are no longer useful, which is the only way to proceed for human beings. Okay. No, no, now I understand better because uh, whereas uh, in, in, in logic, uh, there are these people working because uh, uh, standard logic, uh, the so-called uh, paradoxes of, impli of material implication, and so relevant logic uh, were introduced uh, just for that. And they insist on defining new uh, logical connectives. And in the end, you find an ambiguity, linguistic, metalinguistic, in, in these connectives they use. So the, the distinctions, uh, the distinctions is inescapable, in my un, in my understanding. That's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 in order to have a commentary on a something, you have to have a distinction between the something of, and the commentary. Yes, and then. The more you want that commentary to be meaningful, the more distinctions you generate up to some point where you give up or, or, or agree that it's, uh, it's compatible with what you want. So uh, it's uh, uh, to comment on your statement yesterday, when you say language is identical to metalanguage, I take it to, uh, in the same in the sense that one sentence can be used in both ways, yeah. as uh, uh, Barwise and Etchemendi said. Am I right? Yeah. Or uh, sure. have you sure. to object about it? Uh, sure. That was my my yeah. idea. I say a couple of things, Mark. Yes, yeah, sure. I was actually going to ask you something, but. But um, yes, go. Lou, um, I can't recall exactly where this comes up, but um, Pask and Bastin created some machine out of analog amplifiers, which, if ever had anything to do with analog stuff, means that they had a lot of trouble and they were large objects. And then Ted took this collapse 
uh, bag of post-World War II things to the States and demonstrated it. And that's where I met Pierre. And that's how it all started from that point of view. Oh. Do you remember this? Do you remember this machine, Mike? Did you ever see it? I didn't see the machine, but I've got some documents because I looked, poked into past work and I've got pictures, but I've never actually saw the machine. But as I mentioned on uh, the day I was doing stumming, PASC was actually a customer of a group which I was responsible for, which was selling analog computers prior to the digitization, which <laughs> Dino was talking about. Um, if, yeah, yeah, can, yeah, can you yeah. share those? Can you can you share the pictures on the chat and per chat? I will try and find them. Yes. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if you remember when we were in Liverpool last year and we were in the Stafford Beer Archive. There is a whole pile of boxes of Pasks papers, and they haven't been catalogued. There's there's no uh, you know someone needs to go through it. Some fact, someone needs to go through all the beer stuff as well. Amongst all that stuff. I bet there's some papers relating to this work. And um, I don't remember Andrew Pickering, who's done a lot of work on PASC, or even Paul Pangaro. Maybe Lou, you'll know if Paul Pangaro knows about this stuff. Um, uh, I don't know that I haven't heard anyone talk about this. Uh, may I uh, read, uh, uh, because I think it's relevant uh, to, to what uh, uh, Michael said. Uh, uh, the last uh, paragraph in the uh, report uh, uh, in the transcript of the discussions. Coles, the one who was very much in favor of busting uh, a model, the physical model. Coles, having located at Brussels an analog machine of sufficient size to be set up in three levels, and having got busting a, a dated invitation to set it up, had made it possible for the first time for the technique which had been suggested to be carried out. So uh, this document, which uh, John Anson said, uh, sent uh, to the, the Ampachat, is uh, uh, for me of, of immense value to understand uh, so many things of the later development of AMPA. And also of the questions which were discussed by it per se. So uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, yes. Okay, Just any, few, any other questions? A few, uh, few words on that. Given the name of the analog computer people in Holland or wherever it was, we could probably track that down. As a separate subject, David McGovern and I tried to get the, um, what you might call the ANPA related assets from Clive and Ted and others. And we were only focusing on paper objects or electronic objects. Maybe we should have been looking for amplifiers. Yeah, it's all in the amplifiers. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, I was quite interested in this idea of um, related to understanding the sub level of language through thesauruses and this lattice structure. Can, can you elaborate, Dino, on what, uh, what kind of properties of lattice, as you understand it, would make this suitable for modeling this? sublinguistic level or, or can you speculate on? Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the, this idea of uh, lattices or parcel orders uh, was used by uh, somebody, uh, I can't remember the name now because uh, my age the names just vanish. Uh, some. Uh, a professor at Cologne uh, in what he called uh, uh, formal content analysis and they use lattices to uh, um, for, for this uh, if you 
uh, Google form a content analysis, you'll find some uh, uh, certainly uh, 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 what I'm uh, uh, references to what I'm talking about. The, the other thought I had um, the the concept of the end for meme, where the major premise is unstated um, and becomes a uh, rather like an infer inferential rule uh, yeah. within the, uh, the system of reasoning or the system of production of um, linguistic utterances or thoughts. Um, th this reminded me again of um, hi hierarchies of logic where um, you go from axioms to axiom schemas or you can take a constrained logic and um, elaborate all of the theorems that can be proven from that level and then make them axioms in the next level. Um, so, so it's quite interesting the freedom that it gives you to have that ambiguity to only have the minor premise. Yes, and uh, I think that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in the in the uh, deduction theory, I think uh, is, uh, the, uh, the difference between the axiomatic presentation of a system in which all the premises are stated and uh, a natural deduction model, which keeps the rules apart. And uh, uh, all of this, uh, Lou mentioned uh, lambda calculus uh, and the typed uh, version of uh, lambda calculus to, in computer science to create what they call the logical frameworks. So this distinction between rule and uh, assertion is very, uh, very important uh, in this theory of logical frameworks uh, for what I know in computer science. It just it made me think that perhaps um, allowing that this distinction between language and meta language is is flexible, then possibly um, the constellation of associations between words or concepts. Um, can implicitly form axioms in language users for the creation of new thoughts. So, so that we're, by having um, absorbed language, by having um, participated in the association of, of, of uh, concepts um, in particular structures, then that is implicitly patterning the, the uh, process unconsciously by which uh, new, new concepts are produced or uh, sublinguistic uh, need for expression is articulated into an explicit form. Oh yes, uh, uh, but uh, I, for instance, another thing that occurs to me about this is um, the calculus which was introduced uh, by Lesniewski. And uh, uh, Lesniewski, uh, uh, you can express in, uh, uh, in, in the object language uh, um, what is uh, the, uh, using uh, medieval terminology? Uh, the uh, uh, the re, uh, so regarding concerning things directly statements in a, uh, through a higher order sentence, higher order proposition within the object language. So the object language. Uh, uh, allows you to make uh, metalinguistic statements which are inferentially equivalent to uh, the statement of a metalanguage uh, uh, separated from the object language. And uh, uh, so, and uh, I know that because uh, having to teach medieval logic, uh, uh, the, uh, the point is that uh, with the standard logic, you cannot uh, formalize everything which uh, was said by, the, by these logicians. Whereas if you use Lesniewski's, uh, for instance, uh, an Aristotelian definition, they were distinguishing between the meaning uh, man is a rational uh, animal uh, as a definition from uh, that man is a rational animal. Uh, meaning an, a, a, an assertion uh, on uh, a particular subject. And uh, uh, the point I was trying to make before. And the, in Lesniewski's uh, system, you can express both things quite easily. 
So we and that so it's more expressive than first order logic, which is uh, how, how does he accomplish that? Can you say in a word how he accomplishes that? Uh, uh, well, he wanted to uh, uh, address uh, Russell's paradox, and he built uh, uh, this uh, system. Uh, uh, by the way, he was uh, uh, the uh, uh, the teacher of of Tarski. Uh, Solzhenitsky is one of the Polish uh, schools of, of logicians, uh, and uh, uh, there are. It's a bit neglected, but there is somebody called, I don't know whether Peter or whatever else, Simons, who has a journal, is the editor of Journal History of Logic. He is one who has worked a lot on Lesniewski, both historically. So, And there was another uh, Polish logicians in Britain, uh, who was called Lejewski, who was uh, teaching in uh, Manchester, and uh, he influenced uh, 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 another uh, professor in Manchester, uh, Desmond Henry, who uh, wrote uh, uh, using uh, Lesniewski's system books uh, on the uh, formalization of uh, medieval logic and so i was wondering um, w whether perhaps Znevsky's system is something like girdle numbering but more general since girdle numbering is the granddaddy of the of having the meta level being controlledly inserted into the system itself uh, i i couldn't uh, i couldn't say that i'm sorry but uh, but uh, i i I uh, got uh, uh, familiar with uh, Lesniewski just because I was teaching medieval, <laughs> I was giving courses on medieval logic and so uh, I, I thought that it was very convincing and uh, uh, that uh, the I would like to track that down. Can you spell his name? It's L-E-S-N-I-E uh, w S K Y I. Thank you. And the S as a, as a guy. Something. Yes, Lesniewski. Yes, it might be a. And the S in the. W D maybe. In Polish, as a as a kind of accent on the S, uh, a diacritical on the S, which I don't know what it means. I'll try but, tracking but... it down, and if I get in trouble, <laughs> I'll ask. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat to the Britannica page. Okay, Nicola, did you have a question? You need to unmute. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you, Dino. And uh, I'm sure everybody is very glad that I did persuade you to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's, your, <laughs> yeah. that's your deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now I, I have very basic questions because this is, okay. I mean, there is so much in Ampa that's like basically out of my real sphere. And so I, I can ask them very basic questions. One thing that, so, so I'll, I, would, I will say what the, the three questions are and then we we'll both go back and see what anybody else thinks is interesting. So the first one was that you, you said that um, Parker Rhodes said that uh, of rheumatic that it was invariant in different languages. Um, do, you, do you mean over different languages, which I would find, which I would take exception to, or in any given language? Well, uh, it, 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 no, no, I'll go on with the, with the, with the questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the second question was just like, was very close to that. I was just very interested that the term came from Coleridge, um, and I'm just, because this whole the whole discourse that we're having around language at the moment is you know yeah is very logic based, and obviously Coleridge is a poet, and mm -hmm. so the, there's a whole question of what is being, you know, what this means for him, what, what this, where we, 
Yeah, so the, the nature of language, when Frederick Parker Rose was initially talking about it, you know, the pre-existing, um, and, and also about that it relates to expressible thought. I mean, so, so, so there, there are questions of, of, of mind and language there. Um, and then, so the last one, which again is related, is, is just a question about this, the idea of language as a machine. Was this a, a CLRU idea or was that before? So those are my three sort of questions. Well, that was uh, something it occurred oh, to me okay. <laughs> because I, I think, why not think of language as the, uh, the I think is the uh, privileged machine to deal with a self-organizing system. Because, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, for, for, for uh, philosophical, strange philosophical reasons, because uh, uh, I uh, sort of, uh, oh, um, uh, I have a quotation from, uh, uh, from my favorite uh, Neoplatonic <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> they they yes, say, exactly. Where where did I put it anyway? Uh, yes, that's it. And uh, th this is a quote that I uh, I uh, uh, I used in a former paper, which appeared in the proceeding of, of uh, one of the AMPA conferences. Uh, anyway, in a Neoplatonic text uh, of the sixth uh, century late text, uh, 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 you read the, the following. The dialogue is a cosmos and the cosmos is a dialogue. And according to me, what this statement tells us is that the structure of the universe is the same of the structure of the, uh, of the language that you use to describe it. And that's why I think that uh, uh, the idea we get of the, of the word is very much related to the language we use to describe it. So uh, it's natural, for instance, that uh, uh, if you take uh, the near-potent approach like uh, uh, Peter Rowland's, then uh, the electric, uh, the uh, uh, Electron is not a particle, but it's a field, uh, because the algebraic structure is dealing with uh, uh, implies this. So, uh, 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 and uh, in in uh, in natural language, you can say everything, and uh, if you uh, and they have had this uh, uh, holistic approach, like uh, Leibniz monadology, that each. Uh, 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 part uh, 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 of the cosmos uh, uh, is in relations with all the rest of the cosmos. And for instance, uh, this I think has something to do with uh, uh, that problem which is, uh, I think, uh, philosophically at least a problem in set uh, theory. So if you define a set uh, uh, just by uh, making a list of its member, uh, it's one thing. It, it, it's uh, define a set uh, through a property, uh, then you get into Russell's paradox, because because uh, 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 Leibniz was saying that the uh, the notion of an individual is the set which is a, 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 an infinite uh, uh, set of uh, 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 properties that you can uh, uh, refer to this uh, to, uh, to this uh, uh, object and uh, for instance the, the, the for Leibniz uh, the, the complete notion of Adam is the whole history of mankind so uh, and so there is nothing uh, substantial but uh, uh, it implies that the set of attributes you can refer to an object comes from this pre very high level semiotics which is 
uncertain. Uh, we use uh, uh, not uh, uh, the term uncertainty in Italian to, uh, to qualify uh, Heisenberg, Heisenberg's principle, but we use uh, indeterminazione, something which is not uh, determined, which is different uh, in my uh, understanding from something which is uncertain. Uh, for instance, uh, a probability is uncertain to a degree, but uh, it, it's not undetermined in the sense uh, of uh, Heisenberg, I think. So, uh, uh, the, uh, it, it's two, 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 two ways of approaching uh, the world, as Peter uh, Rollins was saying. Uh, uh, on one side, you have the reality one, on the other, you have reality two. And the use of language uh, depends on you. The Eskimos have four words to describe the snow. So, uh, 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 so that, that they see the world that, that way, not uh, as we uh, we see it. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in 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 Arabic, there is n not even a word for snow. So, uh, anyway. I'm sorry, uh, uh, but uh, another another question by Nicola was uh, uh, about rheumatic. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, 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 I, I didn't uh, mean that uh, rheumatic is invariant in different languages. It's something at the upper, uh, at the higher level. It's uh, an invariant that they have in common. For instance, a literary critic in Italy said that the text is the invariant among all its representations, all its expressions, all its uses the term images. And so you cannot have the text. The text is the invariant among all these sensible meaning uh, perceivable uh, images of the text, the representation of the text, and this uh, rheumatic uh, is the same notion. It's a very abstract notion, like uh, uh, I, I would call it uh, like a deep uh, structure in Chomsky, uh, uh, which is pre uh, linguistic, uh, and so it doesn't belong to a specific language, and that's why it works according to. Parker Rhodes as a, uh, as a means to transfer a content that you express in a language into a content expressed in another language. I would like to propose a cybernetic question. The question is, what is a machine that it might be language? And what is language that it well, might be uh, a I machine? Uh, Let me finish my question build. before you start. Uh, you, you interrupted my question. I was formulating a okay. question. Let me okay. ask it again, and then I'll shut up. Okay, what, okay. Is, what is the machine that it might be language, and what is language that it might be a machine? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, a, a machine that may be, uh, well, it can... Uh, sort of work like language. I think uh, um, if you build a, a neural network and uh, 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 neural networks uh, in Peirce's uh, terminology, uh, people say that uh, uh, they uh, um, uh, work uh, 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 re-establishing induction. No, I think that uh, 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 neural networks work according to what Peirce called abduction. So uh, you use the known cases to confirm a case. You have a case under scrutiny and training the machine uh, with the, the already known cases, you can decide if it conforms to, the, to them or not. So that's a, a, an abductive in Persian 
terms uh, model. So I would uh, uh, think that if you built an adaptive system uh, 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 based on neural networks, you can uh, uh, realize a machine that works like a language. And what language uh, the other, uh, 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 the, the inverse uh, question? Uh, it, it, it depends uh, on, on what language uh, you, you choose. Uh, again, uh, beca because if you use a certain formal language, uh, then you have certain, you can train the network uh, uh, according certain results. If you use, for instance, if you use a nilpotent uh, uh, algebra, uh, you can uh, uh, train the network uh, with the results, uh, known results uh, of the important algebra. And uh, so it, it depends on the, uh, on the choice of, uh, of language because there is not a unique language. A language is a paradigmatic uh, uh, organization of systems. So my so point comes about... Me, uh, sorry, one, one last. What, Go ahead. That we neither know what a, truly what a machine is, that's being investigated, nor what language is, that's also being investigated. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I have a comment about machines because ultimately each machine, we think of a machine as a comp set of computational resources, not saying what kind of algorithms or anything on it, but think of it as some kind of space and some kind of time where the space is usually the state and the, and the time is usually the operands, you know, the, the operators. Yeah. And so, so this general notion of a machine is nothing more than a computational system. It means it has to be informational, but as people like Sir Roger Penrose says, it may not even be computational. It may be informational without being computational. Yeah. And so you have to look at, well, what kind of machine is possible to be informational without computational. And you look at quantum computing and some of that is there, okay? And, but you also look at things like entanglement. Well, that's, yeah. you know, it, it is informational. It might not even be computational, but it's, we would call it non-local, but it's really hyperdimensional. So as soon as you start looking at machines, especially all what's going on with AI and all that's going on with machine learning and all that's going on with language translation, it may be that there's not a language, but a representation, not a language. And Shor's algorithm is a perfect example of that. It's a mathematical representation yeah. that's not a language. And it took a genius like Shor to figure out, oh yeah, I can solve this problem that's polynomial, you know, quantum polynomial time, a new complexity class by using a quantum computer that cheats by using an infinite number of dimensions to solve this problem that we can't do in a classical computer. So you have to you have to look at all of those subjects about machines in that broader context about computational resources representation and not necessarily about language because the way I look at it there's not there's a set of topology maybe that would be closest thing I would call a representation topology but it wouldn't be considered a language like we think about human language now is it meta language yes because I think quantum computing ultimately has to be operand, I call it verb noun balance. It's operand and oper, operand and operator can both be represented in the same system. And yeah. so it's self evolving in that respect. So, so again, more on this when I talk the next weeks, but I just wanted to set the groundwork that language and machines, it's They're more like representation said. and, and well, computation. Well, uh, yes, uh, Lou would say that you have not defined what a machine is and you have not defined what is a language, but uh, I, uh, of, uh, okay. But if uh, uh, you talk about representation, a representation is uh, produced by a set of rules, uh, which in my opinion uh, can be considered a set of uh, li uh, linguistic rules for, for that representation. Uh, language uh, is a very, uh, uh, for instance, uh, like uh, uh, in the humanities, uh, you, you, you can uh, uh, take uh, uh, a picture in uh, 
at the Louvre, uh, uh, as uh, your text, as they call it, historians of art. Yes. So uh, uh, I mean a very, very uh, uh, general uh, uh, notion of language. Uh, natural language is one of the many, uh, uh, well, first order logic is a language and you can give a formal representation. Uh, category theory is another... Uh, so to make my language. point, maybe I'll ask a question this way, is the, what is the representation for the Akashic records? For? The Akashic records. I, 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 I don't get the, the... The Akashic records is supposed to be the library in the sky that all information from all in space and time is available. So as an engineer, I'm going, well, that would be ultimate if I could figure that out, right? So, you know, so, you know, it's like, what well, is the representation that God uh, well, used? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think, uh, I am, uh, I, I would say, uh, I think Lou agrees because uh, what he, 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 he did yesterday is a, a constructive approach. Yeah. So, uh, a language is finite by, uh, in the sense of realization. Yeah. There is some, uh, what uh, Halliday calls higher level semiotics, which is a potential. So, the language never exhausts this potential. Mm -hmm. You have certain rule to sort of, uh, it's like a quarry, uh, like nothing. Uh, uh, to to construct to create something. Yeah, the representation that oh, allows you to if you take all, uh, the, the biblical the biblical uh, uh, narration of uh, of creation is done by distinction. So he, uh, in the first day he separates earth from the sky, and in the second day he separates uh, so and so and so, which is it, it means giving a name. So if you give a name, then you make a distinction. So the two things, it's, uh, I think, uh, 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 isomorphic, for instance, and why am I so fond of second order logic? Because, uh, uh, you know, Lambeck, uh, uh, who, he was a mathematician teaching, he wrote a book on category theory, uh, 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 Karl Lambeck, uh, but, but he was called with another nickname. Uh, in, 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 I attended a conference, a lecture by him here in Bologna. He said, second order logic, yes, it's not complete, but it's categorical. So all the models are isomorphic. So that's quite uh, an advantage. It means that there is semantics. In first order logic, there is no semantic at all. Only a, a, a model theory, well, uh, or people like take uh, you have it uh, when uh, he said, uh, uh, when he, he was talking about uh, other people called possible words, he wasn't talking about something existing uh, somewhere else. No, it was a different model, a different theory about uh, the, 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 the world the world which exists, there is only one so, world. So maybe, so maybe there's another comment I should make here. I distinguish between meaning yes. and semantics. Because, and, and semantics, because yeah. semantics is usually the formal study of meaning, but it's not meaning yeah. itself, you know. And no. so the question is, how can you have meaning for a human mind, let's say, and like a baby, it doesn't have a label for it, but it has meaning. So how, how is that, you know, Again, I'm just, this isn't necessarily um, targeted for you, Dino, to answer the question. I'm kind of opening the discussion to a yeah. broader <laughs> group here that says, yeah. look, we're using these terms as if we agree what they mean. And I'm saying we might not, agree, we might not all have the same meaning for these things. And in fact, I say that we should be choosing better words for some things because language to me is maybe appropriate, but I think there's like yeah. I said, better words, yeah. representation might be better than yeah, language, exactly. even though they might consequently produce one or the other. But I'm just trying to, again, open the discussion up, trying to get you guys to think about what words we're using yeah. and how that, you know, warps our thinking in a good way and a bad way 
and that we might want to choose better words that are more general and more broad, but still um, allow us to talk about it in a useful way. So, Doug, anyway. it, would, it would be great if you drove your presentation around these topics. I mean, they are fascinating. Um, um, yeah, um, my, my first talk was going to be more about sort of like bit physics, and my second talk is going to be more about, well, what is real intelligence, you know, and I wrote literally an entire page of notes about my talk, my second talk, while we were having this discussion today. Yeah, but that's, uh, uh, Dino had that effect on me too, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so, I mean, I was trying to figure out, it's, it's like the blind man and the elephant, where do you start when you have such a big topic? Obviously, my book is over 400 pages long, and so I've been writing it for five years, so in an hour talk, what can I say that will be convincing to y'all that I've been thinking about this a lot? Uh, well, you know? uh, just to, uh, uh, just uh, remarks. Uh, it's not. Yeah. Enough, so. Yeah. So anyhow, but, uh, to, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, seeding, seeding the conversation in for future conversations uh, and preceding both, uh, my talk with some semantic labeling. So both uh, both remarks referring to uh, the uh, uh, holidays approach. Yeah. Uh, in, in one of the quotation I uh, uh, I uh, uh, I used, uh, he uh, mentions the uh, uh, process of uh, learning a language by by a child yeah so syste uh, systemic functional linguistics deals with this mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the other remark is that uh, you are right uh, when you say semantics is uh, is a theory uh, of uh, it's not meaning but because yeah, it's not equivalent uh, yeah. and uh, uh, in in one of the the, the quotation he, 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 uh, Halliday says that semantics is an interface between the meaning potential and the realization mm -hmm. in a specific language, in a specific lexical, lexical grammar. Yeah. So when I get, for instance, I apply uh, data mining, text mining to, to, to get data, I get a, 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 a kind of uh, um, probabilistic result uh, which is uh, one, uh, and uh, uh, if I examine uh, the diagram of the word embedding, I can uh, 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 draw uh, edges between the, the dots and produce a graph. But one, uh, one, uh, uh, um, ver uh, 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 how is it called in a, in a graph, uh, the point? Uh, uh, the node. The node can belong to many different graphs according to your choice, my choice, and other people's choice, mm -hmm. and that's it, how it works. Yeah. I, and I that's believe, why I I believe think humans are, are, to use the term lightly, meaning machines, and that computers don't have any meaning anywhere. I know. And, you know, that we project the meaning on yeah. everything we see, including all the languages and all the formulas and, you know, that there's no meaning, explicit meaning in those things by themselves. So, you know, computers are great at big data, but he, people are the only ones that are good at big meaning. And so those are the kinds of things I've been thinking about for the last five years so, or longer. So. I might make an offering um, just to, to try and address Lou's uh, question, um, what is a machine that it may be language or what is language that it may be machine by taking the approach of weakening it and solving a simpler problem, which is to find an analogy between the two. Um, the, in the etymology of machine, if you go back to the Greek, it's a device or tool, but also a contrivance or cunning. And so I think the similarity between machine and language is that they both act as pivots. Um, a machine is a pivot between a complex problem solving agent and a set of complex problems. And the machine is a simple, more form formalizable thing that can be applied to a lot of complex things by someone with cunning uh, by using contrivance and language and um, we can describe language as having a low informational content in terms of the entropy a, a piece of written sentence has a very small number of bits in it um, but it coordinates complex meaning between the, uh, the the speaker and the listener or the writer and the reader and so in that sense it's a pivot it's a series of points around which coordination of one or more complex systems is allowed to happen. So like you say, with the Akashic records, I, I, I would offer the analogy that by putting some words out there, uh, I create the scaffolding around which our yeah. consciousness but, can coalesce on some meaning together. I, I will use a concrete example from machine translation. 
Google's machine translation is completely self-trained. I mean, there's no heuristics in it. I mean, it's, it's all done. And it's done all, for all these different languages to all these different languages, right? And you can train uh, one machine to learn to translate between English and, tra and, and Chinese, and another one between English and um, Indian, Hindu, okay? And if you then look at that neural net, there's all these nodes in the inter neural net that you can't put a label on what any one of those nodes because it's a distributed meaning for all the nodes in the network what those two are. But if you combine those two, now you can go from Chinese to Hindu, even though, because there's a common quote, representation, even though they've never trained them to do that. Okay, and so that's what the mind does. It comes up with these nodes in a high dimensional space that we don't even have a label for necessarily, but it's effective. And so I'm trying to use that as an analogy for what I'm saying is meaning versus that, language. That's transfer, that's transfer learning in neural network terms. Is that correct? It's a higher dimensional model that doesn't necessarily have a label that represents, represents some kind of semantic point in the space such that, that the same concept is visible in both of those domains. So. And that's like Searle's Chinese room example, animated, brought to life, isn't it? Very old. Mike, Mike Wright. You need to unmute. Can't hear. Mike, press the bit, space bar. I think it may be the space bar trick doesn't work on a Mac. <laughs> Are you able to unmute? Am I, was I muted? You were muted, I'm afraid, yeah. I'm so sorry. I just want to say thanks to Dino for an utterly fascinating talk um, full of the most wonderful ramifications. And I was particularly grateful for all that I learned from it about the motivation and the heuristic of, uh, of the early work on the combinatorial, uh, sorry, the early work on the uh, combinatorial hierarchy in AMPA. Unfortunately, my bandwidth connection here in Turin, uh, where I am uh, tonight, is very, very poor. And, and Dino was cutting out and I'm afraid I missed a lot of the discussion. Um, but I just think on the last point that was made, um, I'm afraid I didn't catch everything that was said. Um, but, but, but on this whole, uh, obviously the extremely, um, uh, extremely profound and you know, ramifying question of, of meaning, um, I would particularly recommend a recent work, which I think may be known to Dino, uh, by one of his Italian colleagues, Alberto Baruzzi, a wonderful essay called What's Behind Meaning? Um, uh, I'm going to have to leave you because unfortunately the connection here is so bad. But I hope to join you for another can session. Can you repeat the, the uh, name? Right? I didn't get the name. Can you can you write it in the uh, chat? Peruzzi, right? Peruzzi, Alberto Peruzzi. I'll write directly to Dino. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks right. again. And I say I'm sorry I wasn't able to follow everything because of the very poor connection here. Um, yeah. I should be in a better place tomorrow. Okay. And then John Torday. And I suggest that we make a systematic error in assuming that language, in my opinion, is a derivative of our physiology. The reason I say that is because embryologically, the way we develop and the way we achieve homeostatic physiology is through cellu cellular communication. I'm just trying to publish a paper on this subject. And the reason I think that that's correct is, as I said in the chat, uh, motor skills. So language is actually just tool making. It's another form of tool making. So you have subject, verb, object. It's, it's a tool-making process. And the reason I think that's correct is because the area of Broca in the cerebrum of only large primate, uh, primates like us and other large primates dwells in the cerebrum. And so you have a common source for both motor skills and language, and it's not coincidence. It's because they both evolved co uh, coordinately. As, and so the question of whether language can be a machine, is it like saying, can biology be a machine? It's not a machine. <laughs> it's organic. It's not, it's not a machine. It's not, the parts are not equal to this. Uh, you know, the whole is not equal to the sum of its parts. Uh, uh, well, but, but then I, I only meant uh, a self-organizing uh, system, machine in that sense, as it was discussed in this pre ampa discussion. In that sense. Thank you, John. Can I butt in very briefly? I, I must say, I think the notion of a self-organizing system 
seems to me to be implicitly much wider than that of a, of a mechanism, of a machine. Yes. Uh, there's a very interesting yeah. literature on this from the late, late yeah. Robert Rosen about the limitations of yes. our notion of mechanism. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah. coming back to partly to what, uh, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forget who it was. I think it was uh, Doug Katsky. John, John Torday. Yeah, no, it was no, it wasn't him. It was somebody else. It was uh, it was Mr. Katsky. I'm sorry if I got the name wrong. Uh, was saying earlier. We, I, I I I think we um we are perhaps tripping over ourselves with um uh, with some of our presuppositions about the meaning of terms here. I I think the notion of machine or mechanism has been stretched beyond breaking point in some of the uses to which it's being put in this discussion. Okay. Okay, right. it's um, two hours in Zoom is probably long enough for anybody. Uh, we've got we've got weeks of this. We can keep going for a long time <laughs> if we want. Um, but Dino, uh, thank you so much. It's it's been a well. It's again, I said it again. Um, it's, it's been a privilege, and um, I'm so glad, Nicola, that you managed to persuade Dino to come and join us. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about music at some point and whether that's a language, but I'm not going to even begin there. But I know that you think a lot about that as well. Um, but um, Nicola, can you say something briefly about what you're going to do tomorrow? Yes. Well, uh, let, let me uh, thank you for this uh, for this uh, uh, closure. But uh, I, I have to apologize because next week, as I was saying to Nicola, uh, I'll be in the mountains and I'll have a very poor connection. I don't know if I could follow. Uh, the series of yeah. talks. Well, Thank you they'll, anyway. They'll all be recorded. Sorry, before, before you ask Nicola, could I just ask Dino one very quick uh, practical question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, uh, Nick, Nick, I think I apologize. Uh, Dino, uh, thank you again for an utterly fascinating talk. Could you just give us the name of the Neoplatonist philosopher from the sixth century from whom you gave this fascinating quotation oh, about an cosmology an, and language? An anonymous uh, um, Ammonius. Text. It's called Prolegomena to oh. uh, uh, to. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll give you. In, in it's okay. Send it. Send, prolegomena send it to, me as a reference. It's, to no Platonic to. philosophy. The Very interesting. I, we, we, we'll a, 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 a I didn't mean to cut across Nicola. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, okay. All right, but, but thank you, Dino. That was right, Nicola. Okay, right. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> uh, as various friends of mine have pointed out, that uh, my title is uh, at least three talks and actually more when it's 21st century Pythagorean mathematics. I will, uh, I think I will probably be starting with the 21st century Pythagorean mathematics and I will be. Uh, setting out some yeah ways that I use some of these terms that we've had in the last couple of days that I use differently and I think that that's I mean I think that's the value of these uh, conversations is you know as you were saying Doug we, we need to yeah find out what what languages can we share what what how so this is I mean this is this is the human situation now. And I actually think that 2020 is a very important year. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I've said enough. Okay. Well, can I thank you all for coming? It's, it seems to me that we're having uh, enormously deep conversations here. Our, our minds somehow are tuning into each other, despite the fact that we're spread all over the world. That's, that's a new experience for me. And um, it's something which, um, my university, which is obviously like all universities, is trying to teach online, but teach in a very shallow and transactional way. And um, we're doing something different here. And, and that seems important. This, this came from all of our minds, not just... Yes. Just yeah, no, no. It's, hap it's happening to all of us. Uh, so this is very interesting. So thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. And I look forward to Nicola's presentation. And thank you, Dino. Um, all the videos will be online. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to catch you this week. So thank you very much. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. 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 <laughs>